Welcome to this week's Operden Talks. We are delighted to have with us Sonu Shivdasani. Educated at Eton and Oxford, Sonu quickly became a young and very fresh-faced founder of luxury hotels. Alongside his wife, Ava, he not only built and sold Six Senses Group, but in 1995, they leased a tiny private island in the Maldives and started Soneva Fushi. The resort has grown to a group and is renowned across the globe, not just for its luxury, but for its sustainability. Alongside life as an entrepreneur, Sonu is renowned for his focus on charitable projects too, raising millions for environmental causes through the Soneva Foundation. We are hugely lucky to have him with us today. Sonu, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Walter. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Sonu. So um, as you perhaps might know, we're a mentoring business where we work with children all over the world. Um, you yourself had a pretty global education, school in the UK and then Switzerland and then Oxford. Um, tell us about it was, that. Uh, it was slightly more global than that. So I spent uh, about a year in uh, Nigeria. Uh, my father was very successful trading with the country. And this was a time where Africa and Latin America, instead of lowering their, their import duties and their tariffs to encourage trade and competition, um, in the old days, in the 70s, these, these uh, developing countries did the opposite. So they raised barriers. And um, my father had, been, um, had count, counted for about 90% of all the tomato-related products imported into Nigeria. This was just when they were discovering oil. And the Minister of Trade uh, got in touch with him one day and said, um, you know, we're going to ban tomato-related products in a year because we believe we can be self-sufficient in tomato ketchup and, you know, uh, whatever, you know, the tomatoes you use for pasta and so on. So, um, so he, he, he was given some land near the Sahara, uh, about 10,000 acres, and asked to make the country self-sufficient. So he took me out of school. This was pre-prep school. And um, I had a donkey and I'd take the donkey to the local village. The little village was about five miles away. Sometimes the tutor would come and see me. Um, and so that was like about a year um, before my prep school, yeah. And, and then of course, yeah, there was Eastman Oxford and I spent a bit of time. I spent a year in, in Switzerland as well. Yeah. Nice. And, and, and happy memories of it as an educational experience. Oh, but for our, for our listeners, what were your reports like? Uh, <laughs> they weren't um, fantastic. So, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I sort of get by. Um, I did quite well in common entrance and um, I got 11 O levels. But, um, you know, the, it was so easy at Eton because they taught you so well. So um, even if you weren't that bright, you could easily get um, the 11 O's. Um, and then I went to a tutorial college in Oxford and then did the Oxford term to get into the university there. So, um, so it was, um, yeah, no, it's a... Um, I, I think it was, a, it was an interesting um, time, and um, even the time in Nigeria was great. And for a child um, to be able to be on a farm uh, of 10,000 acres with space, and um, my father taught me how to drive a little tractor, and, um, and, and then eventually the Mini Moak um, when I was about seven and a half. So um, I used to have a great time, yeah. And did you, um, did you always know you were going to go into the hospitality industry? How did you get into that initially? No, that was... Um, uh, by accident. So I had no idea of what my career uh, would be. Um, I, children tend to follow the parents, the footsteps of their parents, because it's, there, there's, I think, a natural conditioning by the parents. Not, not, not an insistence, but it's just that uh, you're interacting with your parents and they're doing something. So you find that actors, children are quite often actors, etc. And um, so I thought I'd be an entrepreneur, but um, I had no fixed idea. And then um, my father passed away when I was 13. Um, my brother was overseeing the business. He was quite young. He was only 25. And this was a time when the price of oil dropped to $7 uh, a barrel. So for a company that was largely importing into um, Nigeria, um, they had no foreign exchange. So it was a very difficult time. And my brother said that there wasn't really much that I could do uh, and offer or, or, or value add. And so he asked me to look at other opportunities. And when I was at university, I met Eva. Uh, we used to come to the Maldives a lot because um, English universities, as you know, are three terms of eight weeks each. So that's only 24 weeks. It means the majority of the year you, you can travel, provided you're studying a bit. So we used to base ourselves out here. In those days, uh, the resorts were very simple. It was not one island, one nation. It was one island, one tour operators. You had uh, TY, uh, Neckerman, LTU. Uh, I think Thompson were just starting. So it was very much mass market tourism in the country. 
plastic chairs, neon lights, white, white tiles. Uh, it was a bit like being back in school. The food came in the tins, even the vegetables and, um, you know, the peach dessert um, and the cherries. Um, so it was, um, yeah, and uh, it wasn't very sustainable because they'd chop a lot of the vegetation down. Um, it, everything was salt water. So they weren't processing the sewage before sending it out into the sea. Um, or it was affecting the water table. So um, we felt we could do something better. So we went to the ministry, saw, asked if we could just lease an island to build a house. They said no. Um, and um, then they asked us to bid for islands. We, we put some bids in, but um, it didn't really work because everyone else who bid for islands had these bed contracts from tour operators, these 10-year guarantees, which we um, didn't want to do because we wanted to work with lots of different people from different countries. We wanted to create a luxury resort and something that was more cosmopolitan. So um, uh, we, we gave up that idea and a few years later, we came across this island which had been abandoned by a tourist project. So um, we managed to take it over. This is um, when I say this island is never pushy where I am. Mm. Yeah, paradise itself. How on earth did you have the bravery in that moment? What was that like when you decided, yeah, we're gonna get involved in developing yeah, well, an island? I mean- Yeah, well, when it, yeah, I suppose when you're young, you don't really think so much. It's, it's, um, it's I mean, I, I suppose it depends on the, the, the people, but. Um, I think combination of youth and uh, my character. I think my um, right brain is much more active than my left brain. And so um, I didn't really think of the dangers. Um, I described sort of developing in the Maldives in those days. Um, there are lots of other uh, Maldivian developers who've been very successful over the years. And um, I describe our experiences at the time as jumping off a diving board uh, where the swimming pool has no water in it. And you just hope that by the time you come towards the surface, it's, it's filled up with water and um, fortunately it happened because we had no experience in either hospitality or building. You had to be a contractor here because there were no third party contractors. So um, a, a lot of this was new to us. Um, you, you, I mean, you created what many claim to be the sort of template for sustainable tourism. Um, mm. You did ecotourism, you know, before sort of protecting the environment really became a thing. Um, yeah. It's not a cynical question, but you know, did you foresee the importance of ESG or is there a sort of deeply rooted ingrained sense of responsibility in the projects that you do? I mean, how does, how do the concepts of slow life and intelligent luxury kind of tie yeah. into to the businesses you do? Yeah, yeah I, um, I, I think in those days we were really thinking about what we believed made sense. Mm -hmm. um, so um, late 1980s England, um, you had Thatcherism, a lot of development. You'd see a lot of it, environmental damage. Um, James Lovegrove was uh, Lovegrove, Lovelock. I can't remember Lovegrove uh, was talking about um, you know the Gaia theory, you know, with his Gaia theory and about global warming. Um, and you'd see the British country, countryside completely change. Um, beautiful rolling pastures suddenly turn into big housing estates. Um, Ava was Swedish. Uh, Ava is Swedish, and um, the Swedes have always been very sustainable. So you know they were separating waste uh, back in the 80s. They had issues with um, the, the, the bad environmental management of the former Soviet Union and the impact that had on Sweden, which was a neighboring country in terms of acid rain and, and other issues. So the Swedes were also quite sensitive. And then we arrive in a destination where obviously the environment is the key selling point. So, um, so it was important to us. Uh, slow life is our core purpose. It's very much part of our DNA. It's an internal message, um, not an external message because essentially what we're doing is we're taking concepts that traditionally people would think were opposites. So people would traditionally say, well, if it's sustainable, it can't be luxurious. Or if it's luxurious, it can't be good for you. You know, health, wellness, and uh, sorry, and, and, and sustainability and luxury, they aren't opposites. They go hand in hand at Sameva. And um, you could argue that the more sustainable we are, the more luxurious we become. So it's been a very important part of our, our DNA. And I think, I think the, one of the fortunate things we've had is where we have our own islands, so we've been everything here. We've been the welfare state because the the, the country didn't have a welfare state. Uh, we've had to manage um, uh, the sewage and the you know waste management, and we had to generate our own power and desalinate our own water. So um, the necessity to do that has made us think about the consequences of what we're doing from day one. You know, normally when you just plug in to the grid uh, and you you plug your waste into the grid as well. You don't really think about what happens to it and you know and how it's managed so when you have to start managing it yourself in this pristine environment those start to become important considerations so i think that's helped us as well and people talk about the food at Sneva being um unique and remarkable it's also because 
we're on an island, so our guests can't go out to a neighboring restaurant. Whereas I think if you started life as a city hotel, the restaurant and the food wouldn't be so important because most guests dine out. So, um, so some of those things like sustainability, food, they're out of the necessity, um, you know, um, uh, yeah. Can I ask in those early days, was there a biggest challenge? I'm sure there were many, but was there something that really got in the way of progress for a while? I think it was getting people to accept our point of view. Uh, we hired lots of hoteliers. Uh, hoteliers quite set in their ways. And uh, I think they thought we were very bizarre. Um, but then over time, you know, um, what, what, we, uh, what we were doing made sense. We were quite successful. We won lots of awards. And uh, we started to attract people who shared our values. So, so rather than being a minority, uh, we became the majority and it made life much easier. So I think that was always our big challenge is to, is continuously changing culture uh, mindset. We we have to continuously change all the time, and um, that's one of the things um, uh, that we have, even with um, some of the sustainability challenges um, of the twenty first century. It's not like the solutions aren't there. It's not like we don't have solutions. Very often there are solutions, but we don't, we don't want to change the the way we go about things. So, for example, solar in most parts of the world, um, I, actually there are very few parts of the world where solar um, is not one of the most cheap, one of the cheapest forms of energy, even against incumbent coal plants um, in some destinations. Um, but why is solar not more prevalent? I mean, in the Maldives, uh, diesel costs you half, uh, sorry, costs you double, uh, costs you double of solar. Solar is half the cost, but uh, there are very few solar plants here. People are just used to doing the same thing. Changing is very difficult when we ban branded water. The arguments we used to have at those days, we had six senses with about 12 hotels open at that point in 2008. Um, the, the, the discussions we used to have and the excuses we'd have from our management team as to why they couldn't make the change was uh, incredible. So I think that's been the biggest re resistance has been um, mindset, you know, fixed mindset. And, um, and, and, and Henry's asked about challenges. I can imagine the last four or five months have been challenging for you and Eva. What have been the implications of COVID-19 um, and how have you dealt with those? Yeah, um, it's, it's been an interesting four to five months. Um, I think it's been quite enriching. Uh, we, we've had a few crises over our life, um, during our life, um, especially, you know, operating in remote locations, setting up a business in different parts of the world. Uh, we've met with many crises. And um, over the years, I've, I've come to find crises as an opportunity uh, and I, I, I take a lot of wisdom from um, ch Chinese um, philosophy. So um, uh, I love the quote of Lao Tzu, um, good fortune has its roots in disaster. The idea that this crisis brings um, good fortune and, and, um, uh, and, and something good. And I think if you approach a crisis with a modern, uh, sorry, with a positive uh, mindset, uh, it, it, it can be very, very helpful. And I've, I've come to look at crises as that. If you look at, if you consider the Chinese word for uh, crisis, it's two characters. One is danger. The character represents danger. So you have, to, of course, have to address the danger. And then the other is change and opportunity. And I believe that COVID has presented a fantastic um, amount of change and opportunity. Of course, there's been danger. We've had to ensure that um, our hosts have been safe, our guests have been safe, and uh, the business is, of course, financially safe. But once we address that, we focus very much on the opportunity and the change. And um, we found that quite enriching. And I uh, suspect that when we look back at this year in sort of January or February 2021, uh, we might not regret what happened and um, uh, find that overall we've benefited um, from the experience. Um, it's of course, we've, you know, we've been impoverished financially, as, as a lot of people have, and in particular our sector. But um, I think um, in terms of an organization, a team of people understanding each other, um, understanding ourselves and our learning, um, I think we're all the wiser for it. So I think it's, it's, been, um, it's been good for us. Yeah. Will, will that positive impact be cultural then? Is that what you're saying? Or will it be something concrete you've learned from it? Yeah, so will, will the positive impact be cultural? I, I, I would like it to be cultural. It is now. Um, it takes, as we know, it takes 20 days to form a new habit and a lot more days to unform. And the nice thing about, uh, in a way, this lockdown is we've had a lot of time to break our old habits and create new habits. And I, I think we'll all be quite surprised as to how we operate. I think what we're doing now with these Zoom webinars is, is not gonna go away. Um, for me, uh, uh, corporate travel, 
will halve. I, I think I'll be able to halve it at least, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are permanent changes that I'll make. I think um, as an organization, we, res we respect each other. We have greater priorities. I think we're more focused. And over time, if not immediately this year, but within, within the next couple of years, we will benefit from all that we've learned as a result of this. So, so Sonny, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig a little bit deeper into what makes uh, Seneva so brilliant. Um, we had Antonio and Carla Cesale from Le Serenuse on the show last week. Yeah. And, um, they spoke about service as being the most important aspect. Hmm. Uh, I think um, Antonio talked about that being there to help rather than to serve. Both Henry and I have been extremely fortunate to be on Seneva Fushi. And what dawned uh, on us, and I know lots of the guests, is the, the absolute um, brilliant service that, that there is on the island, but to yeah. such an extent that it doesn't feel like it's service at all. Right. And I ask, what is your secret to creating such a unifying, yeah. such a unifying ethos across um, all the staff who work there? Yeah. So how do we create this unifying ethos, yeah. um, this sort of service feel? Yeah, um, yeah I, I think I just want to ga gather my thoughts. So I think um, uh, just... Because we, we, we yeah. did, you know, we noticed from the, from the Miss Fridays and from, from the chefs and from the yeah. people working in the den, there was, there was a unifying narrative, there was a unifying yeah. philosophy. Um, yeah. It Good. was amazing. So, so my, my, my real title is the guardian of the culture. I believe that the prime job of a CEO is um, to create a culture um, and to drive behavior. Um, and values, philosophy, language creates that. So that's why, uh, for example, uh, we don't have employees, we have hosts. You can imagine arriving at an island with 350 employees on an island with 350 hosts. Of course, the guest experience is going to be different. So uh, values, philosophy, culture, driving that, is, is my priority, it's the priority of the core team. Um, and I, I think that um, plays an important role. We have the sun card, so this is, um, I, I don't know if you were given a sun card, did you go through an induction? No. Oh, you didn't, okay. No. Well, next time you should ask for an induction, but oh, at an induction, everyone gets this Suneva sun card. Mm -hmm. um, and we call it the Suneva sun because um, I like uh, Janine Banuels, um, uh, her, her theory of biomimicry, where you follow the planet and patterns of nature to lead one's life. So she describes um, the helicopter being um, um, inspi inspired by the hummingbird. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci's first drawings of the helicopter, which um, Igor Sikorsky used, were his observations of a hummingbird. So nature inspiring what we do. Um, the honeycomb, the, the strength of a honeycomb, uh, as an example. And... Um, so we believe that our resorts are planets, and then the sun is, is what we all um, you know, revolve around, and it's, it's what keeps us um, alive, and it's our values and what makes us different. So, and one of the key things in our sun card is this, it's the virtuous circle. Um, so a lot of businesses start, uh, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, I can see that, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of businesses start with, uh, oh, sorry, two seconds, something's happened to my laptop here, okay. <laughs> Okay, so, um, yeah, so a lot of businesses start with, um, you know, the numbers and then they think a bit about guests and then about employees. So for us, the virtual circle is first create a philosophy and a concept and values that inspire your hosts. Uh, your, your hosts are then inspired. Uh, they stay with you longer. Uh, they're passionate about what you do. They then create magic for the guests and then you get a financial result. So it's, um, I believe that's the way a business should be run. And if you just focus on the numbers first, you're going back to front. And I think that's what quite often happens with businesses when they're acquired from founders. It looks very good in the first few years because uh, the costs are cut, so the numbers look good. And then um, the, the new owners uh, are not operating it on that basis of you know, creating a philosophy values that inspire your employees so that they can deliver magic or uh, unique things and deliver above exceptional returns. And after a couple of years, you find these businesses just dwindle. Um, and I think, um, I think so that, that's a, a, a key point. Um, I think the other point is that uh, my wife, Eva and I, uh, have always believed strongly that a company, um, especially in the 21st century, uh, must have a purpose beyond simply enriching shareholders like Eva and I and our partners or paying our employees salaries. And when you can do that, it can be very meaningful. And our Slow Life Core Purpose, where the first L 
in slow life stands for local, um, rings very true to our hopes because we don't hire just from the Maldives um, or from Thailand, but we hire from the islands nearby. So at Suneva Fushi, where you were, uh, a lot of our guests come from, sorry, a lot of our hosts come from Ma Ed of Fushi, which is a kilometer away, Malos, etc. And then we engage and support those islands. So we have Sunema Numuna Bar, uh, which is our latest initiative where all our water revenues go to. It's about a half a million dollars a year plus some other contributions. And the idea is to eliminate single use plastic in these islands. So like you have here at Suneva Fushi, a water bottling plant, we built one on Malos. Malos was the first island in the Maldives to end open burning. Um, so we created an eco centre where they're recycling their waste, no more open burning, where they put all the rubbish together and light a fire. Uh, there's a cricket pitch there and President Nasheed launched the eco centre we played cricket with Harbhajan and Singh, who's a, a very good Indian uh, spin bowler. And so, um, uh, and, and then inspire. Uh, there's no word in the Maldives. So there's reduce with the glass bottling plants. Uh, and we want to roll more of those recycle with the Ecocentro turning cardboard and food into compost uh, so they can grow vegetables and sell us vegetables and feed their island. Um, uh, compacting the aluminum tins, giving them to us so we can make something out of it. You know, books at Suneva Jani is an example. So um, there's, there's Recycle and then there's Inspire, which is um, um, uh, teaching children how to swim, firstly. It, Maldivians are scared about the water. This is a marine environment, lots of beaches. There's no word for beach. Uh, the literal translation of beach is there where you throw the rubbish, because historically the rubbish was organic, the banana or the coconut or the fish bone. And um, so uh, on Edifushi, everyone above seven knows how to swim. Suddenly you now have beaches for people to swim. They don't throw the rubbish on the beach um, and they, they collect it and, and, and recycle it, snorkeling lessons, surfing, etc. cetera. So, um, so by engaging with these islands, uh, it, it, it's meaningful for our hosts. Uh, they believe a lot in what we're doing. They become big, big converts, evangelists uh, for Suneva. And they get up every morning proud of the company they work for, wanting to create magic. Mm -hmm. And I agree with Antonio Sassali. I think... Um, Service is um, the key determinant of what um, uh, luxury is about. It's not about how big the villa is. We have the largest lead-in villas in the world. It's not about the food. Some hotel, some hoteliers and restaurateurs say the best hotel food they've ever had is is here. And so, Neva Fushi, it's not about the spa. You know, with Six Senses Spa, we created some of the first spas where we were operating. It's about the service. And magical service can only be trained to an extent. It has to come from the gut. And I think that our slow life core purpose instills that. So. Coming back to what I said earlier, the more sustainable we are, the more luxurious we become because the more true we are to our slow life core purpose, the more um, inspired, engaged, and passionate our hosts are to deliver magic for our guests. And that's why we're one of the few hotel groups to have won the equivalent of the Oscars for sustainability in travel and tourism and also luxury in travel and tourism more than twice. So for example, the readers of Condé Nast Travel UK, which is still a very big market to Asia at the luxury level, voted us uh, best of the best, best of all categories, city hotels, airlines, uh, hotels throughout the world, countries um, in 2000 and again in 2008. And in 2008, the World Travel and Tourism Council, which is the private sector uh, government partnership, um, voted um, um, us, um, they gave us their Tourism for Tomorrow Award in, in, in Dubai when they met, and then in 2015 in Madrid. So, so really sustainability and luxury do go hand in hand. and. Um, um, through our guiding principle of intelligent luxury, where we're questioning and challenging what is a luxury for the, well, uh, for the, you know, people who can stay in our resorts, um, who are um, quite well off and successful, um, and who are urban, uh, no longer rural, um, you know, quite often the more sustainable option is also the more luxurious, like walking barefoot or having the rocket salad that was plucked from the garden that morning or seeing the stars through one of the largest telescopes in the Indian Ocean or Having just simply having a shower, um, listening to the hotel's bone sound system, and seeing uh, on, and with your favorite song already downloaded on the on our iPod, and and seeing the moon. So um, I think those are things that are simple, natural, sustainable, but also, if you're living in the city, a big luxury. Because luxury is about that which is rare, which you don't get every day. Can I can I ask? I think we've probably got time for a question left each, I would guess, Walter, and then <laughs> our quick fire yeah. round, which is which are yeah. short, concise ones. My question is, I'm sure there are a lot of people watching this who just think this guy, Sonu, he has the best job on earth. He must, this is the perfect job. He's right. created and lives on his own private island. 
what would you answer to those people? Is it the perfect job? Uh, we love it. We love our lives. Um, it's, we're always sad to leave here, uh, which is nice. Uh, we're happy to arrive at a new destination and then sad to leave there again. So yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been a great life and um, I, I couldn't ask for more. Of course, there've been crises and difficult times and challenges, but um, if you look at them in a positive way um, and look at them as a learning, um, even if sometimes people have done you wrong, um, I think that it, um, it helps you if you can find it quite um, helpful. So um, yeah, no, we, we've had a, a great life and um, yeah, we, we want to continue doing what we're doing. We're very passionate about it. And, um, and, and where does the future lie then for this Never Group? Are you planning on, on creating new resorts? Um, uh, two more in the Maldives. Uh, we like Japan as well. So we're working on a site there. Um, so so that's, uh, that will be our, our current priority. Uh, we're doubling the size of Sunevajani at the moment because it's very large. It's, it's six islands, uh, six kilometers. Mm -hmm. So we're adding another 25 water villas there. And uh, yeah. And, and then continuously evolving the slow line philosophy and COVID's given us a lot of new ideas on how we could do that. Um, Excellent. Exciting. Well, we, we wish you well for it. Before you leave us, we quite like our little quick fire round because it gives us okay. the chance to ask you questions with very short answers. Good. So I'll let Walter kick off and you have to try and keep them as, as concise as you can. Good. Okay. So Sonny, my first question is, what was the last piece of advice you gave somebody? Last piece of advice, um, I think a couple of days ago, a couple of days ago. Um, one's always giving advice. And what was it? Mm. Yes. Um, I, like, I, I like the quote of Einstein. Um, you have to be prepared to give up who you are to become who you will. We so often get conditioned by um, our everyday lives and so on. And, and sometimes you need to just free that up um, and new things will come. If, if you could learn one new skill, what would it be? One new skill. I think I'd like to be um, a musician. I think it's, it's a pity. Um, a lot of my friends did music at school. Their parents insisted and I didn't. I would love to have been able to have learned at a young age uh, a musical instrument. What's your most treasured item, Sonny? Treasured item. Um, well, my glasses are quite clearly quite important. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, think, um, I have a lot of notes in my moleskin, um, so that's key. Uh, the phone is really useful. Um, the iPhone has been very useful for everyday life, just communicating. It's so easy to communicate nowadays. Um, yeah. You must be one of the very few people who's ever actually lived out the Desert Island Discs fantasy. <laughs> you, you are living it day by day. Right. Um, this is a, a question for you. What phrase would you like to banish from the world? Spanish. Um, it would be a negative phrase. Um, I can't do that or um, it, impossible. I think those are phrases that I think uh, are not great. I, I, I like um, the words of Henry Ford. He, he said that if you, if you believe that you can do it or you believe you cannot do it, in both cases, you'll be right. And um, so much what we achieve and are able to achieve is based on um, how we frame our mind. Mm. Can I ask, um, has there been a book uh, that has influenced you the most? A book um, that's influenced me the most? Um, I need to think about that. Oh, um, a book that's influenced me the most. There have been lots of great books. Um, no, I, I, I quite like... Um, I like uh, a lot of what Chip Connolly writes, the hotelier. Um, he created Joie de Vivre, a hotel chain. Um, he, he, some of his ideas on how he manages his business. Um, he did a lovely book um, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs called Peak. Um, so I, I found that quite um, inspiring. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm continuously reading lots of interesting books. It's, uh, I'm reading uh, Danny Mayer. I just finished um, Setting the Table, very successful restaurateur in New York in the service industry. It's very uh, interesting to hear what um, he has to say. Um, I even found Steve Jobs' book, you know, the Walter Isaacson version, quite inspiring for um, what I'm doing. I think his, his intense focus uh, was very interesting. Um, I think it's a good lesson that. for children there. Keep learning, keep educating yourself. You are never- Oh, oh yes, I, I, exactly. I mean, another Einstein quote is, when you stop learning, you start dying. And, I, and uh, funny enough, like when I was, um, I graduated from university, I had this funny mindset that, 
you leave, uh, you leave university and then you've done all your learning for a lifetime and you get on with another life. And that was really the mindset we had when I graduated. And um, uh, that's changed so much because the world changes so quickly and the knowledge evolves. The half-life of our knowledge is so short now. I, I tell our engineers that um, you know, within five years, half of what they learned at university is now redundant. So it's, um, yeah. It, one, has to it. one more question for you from me, which is if you had to live anywhere else, where would you choose to live? If I had to live anywhere else, where would you choose to live? Um, well, if it was a city, um, it would have to be by the water. So I, I quite like the idea of San Francisco. Um, we, we love, um, I'm just thinking where else we love. Um, we at Barcelona by the sea is quite nice. The food is amazing. Uh, I love the food there, um, and the climate's quite nice. So um, it would have to also have a bit of sun as well. And we love Tuscany. We love Florence. Uh, we've always thought about living there at some point. Um, but ideally, close to the sea would be good. Um, well, Sonny, I, I love setting the table. I love the virtuous circle. Um, I love oh. uh, I love Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and I love Seneva. So thank you. Uh, from me, a huge thank you for joining us. Actually, a great book, actually, on uh, leadership is Hostage at the Table. Um, ho yeah, Hostage. It's by George Kohlreiser. He was a New York police uh, hostage negotiator, and he realized that a lot of his experience applied to the corporate world. So that, that's a great book as well. I think it's, it's um, something hostage, um, uh, you know, that you have in your office, in your, in your everyday life setting. So that's another great book. Thank, thank you very much, Walter. Uh, great, great to well, see you. Well, Thank from you. the from the sublime to the ridiculous, we're going to ask you to compete in our challenge, which is biscuit face. So we've okay. had the great and the good here, from sports people, international sports people, to authors like Sebastian Fawkes, now to one of the world's greatest hoteliers, Sonu Shivdasan. Right. What biscuit have you got for us today? Okay, I've just got this Swedish cracker. I think it's made from. It's quite healthy, um, so I'm, I'm, I avoid flour, white flour, dairy sugar and red it looks meat. looks excellent. It also looks oh. like it's got sticking power, which is important. So uh, I'm not sure all you need to re remove your glasses. We're going to give you 30 seconds yeah. to try and get that biscuit from your forehead to your mouth without using your hands. Oh, that'll, that'll be impossible. And we've uh, had the, the fastest man we had at this is, is a, who always, always getting practice in. There we go. Okay. We'll, give you, yeah. we'll give you 20 more seconds. Actually, you know what? I'll do this. Um, oh, he's, he's making it smaller. <laughs> Shit. Okay. I think I just, let me try once more. Okay. Very few people have actually succeeded in this. I think the record is six seconds. Uh, I, I think I give up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a lovely attempt, though. The uh, the fastest we had was five and a half seconds by a man with a beard and a hob hobnob. So mm -hmm. um, you know, mm. th there's something to aspire to there if you're looking. To yeah. I have to carry on practicing. Mm. Mm. Sonu, a big thank you from both of us. We're very grateful for your time and for your input. Hugely fascinating career, and I think a lot to learn from in the sustainability world for those listening. Thank, thank you. you so much. And we look forward to seeing those with us on Offered and Talks next time.